So my last video on making this awesome PID line following robot blew up on my channel. In fact, it was the most viewed video with around 5,800 views. Thanks a lot to you guys for that. And I saw many of you guys discussing in the comment sections the several problems that you are facing while building one. So this is a quick compilation or a video where I discuss the top 10 mistakes that beginners make while building a line following robot. Let's get started. Mistake number one, choosing the wrong sensors. Well, sensors are just like receptors for your robot, which helps your robot to understand the environment in which it is placed in. Hence, it's very important to invest some quality time in researching the best possible sensor available for your application. Well, in, in our case, it is a line following robot, so it needs a IR array sensor, which consists of several IR sensors clubbed over one another in the formation of an array. And I have been using this particular sensor as I discussed in my previous video. This is the 12th channel sensor from Hyperdrive, which is Autonomous Robotics Community in Kolkata. It consists of 12 individual TCRT 5000 based sensors in it, which gives quite accurate results, at least for the competitions in my region where I live in. Apart from this, there are a number of other sensors available on the market. Let me just show you guys those. These are generic uh, 8 array IR sensors and these are easily available in local markets such as Chandni market in Kolkata and these are good these are not quite reliable but I have used it for a lot of builds before and they gave me good results but it's also important to note that these uh, lack reliability so if you are buying these considering to buying these make sure you purchase two three four or even five of them or maybe even half a dozen because uh, at any point of time during the competition or during your test runs these can go bad without any reason and I find reliability to be quite a big issue over there but yeah these are quite cheap it costs around 250 rupees so if you're just getting started have a very limited budget you can consider getting these uh, last but not the least that I have uh, with me right now are these sensors these are the Prolulu IR sensors which is also an 8 array IR sensor but the thing is these are analog sensors that is they do not give a discrete value like 0 or 1 to your microcontroller when sensing the line instead it gives a value ranging between 0 to 1024 if i'm not wrong and you guys need to determine thresholds by doing a little bit of calibration basically deal with the sensors in terms of thresholds the problem with the sensors is that these sensors are very small in terms of its sensor width the individual spacing between the sensors are very small and for the competition around the region in which i live in the line width is generally preferred around 2.5 to 3.5 centimeters and for that thick of a line I do not prefer these sensors at all but if you guys insist on using these i recommend you to use two of them like placed one beside another to get a total 16 bit of resolution and then it might be helpful although it becomes a little bit computationally expensive so it's your call but i do not recommend these one well that was a lot of explanation now coming to the second mistake is placing your sensors incorrectly in your robot many people place their sensors too close to the wheels or too far from the wheels which highly affects how their robot performs while tuning and even in their final run what i recommend is you place your sensors around 10 to 15 centimeters from your wheelbase so that you can get the optimum performance from your bot and this is totally based on experience and specifically for competitions that is being held in kolkata region i do recommend this setup if you place your sensors towards the higher end of what I suggested, around 15 centimeters, you will get a super responsive bot, but it will definitely struggle when there are tight gaps, tight turns, sharp turns. But it will be a pleasure to watch your bot running fearlessly through the tracks if it is a race track. However, if you place your sensors too close to your wheels, that as I suggested around 10 centimeters, then it will be beneficial for your bots to navigate easily even in tight turns. But that will come at the cost of speed. Your bot will not be a super fast speedy bot. However, it becomes reliable. Mistake number three, bad PID tuning. Well, everyone wants a super fast bot, but no one has the time to dedicate to properly tune their bot and get the optimum performance out of it. Increasing the base motor speed in a badly tuned PID based line following robot will only make situations worse for you. Your bot will not even perform the way it used to perform before and you will encounter endless number of exceptions and problems while giving the final run. So what do I suggest is first, you take the time to tune your bot at a very slow speed and once you are satisfied with its performance you can then slowly climb up the ladder to increase the PID settings as well as the speed simultaneously to get the optimum performance of your bot. Increasing the base speed is not the solution. Mistake number four, choosing the wrong motors. Well, I do use something called as GB37 side shaft motors. These are manufactured by Rhino and is currently available at RoboKits India. But do I recommend this to you if you are building your first LFR bot? The answer is absolutely not. What do I recommend? 
are these motors these are n20 motors and in my opinion these are the best motors that you can use for building an lfr board now the question comes if i do recommend these and do not recommend this why i'm using these well, the way that my bot is coded and the way that I have tuned my bot, I find my tuning to be perfectly aligned and in rhythm with this particular setup. Well, that is a totally personal preference that I do have. But I have seen many teams, many experienced players complaining that these motors are not the optimum choice for them according to the tuning that they prefer to do. And the most reliable and efficient motor solution in my opinion is the n20 motors going with something around 600 to 1000 rpm is the sweet spot according to me so you can get started with those or if you do prefer to experiment do feel free to buy these gv37 motors i prefer you buy somewhere around 600 to 300 rpm you can try a thousand rpm but those lack in torque a lot so i do recommend the sweet spot is around 600 rpm motors and you can definitely experiment with those apart from that there are a lot of motors the super cheap bio motors are not at all recommended those comes with plastic gears and those lack responsiveness those lack reliability and the list goes on i do not recommend to use the bio motors at all although they are quite cheap around 60 to 80 rupees per piece do invest some amount of money in buying quality motors so that you can get a reliable setup and not have the fear of burning your motors down mistake number six poor power management well, in order to power everything in your bot, including the sensors, the actuators, the microcontroller and every other powerable component, we have to choose a very reliable source of power. Now, I have seen a lot of people using adapters for their line following robot, which is not at all recommended because after all, it's an autonomous bot. You are powering it with a wired cable. That means you will always have to be over your bot to pull that cable so that it doesn't get tangled within its wheels or its other moving components. So that is a big hassle and is not at all recommended in my opinion. What leaves us is with battery packs. Now what battery pack do I suggest? Do I suggest LiPo packs? Do I suggest lithium ion packs? Do I suggest the generic AA batteries that comes with your TV remote? The answer is my recommendation is to use a LiPo pack. Now why? There are a couple of reasons for that. Let's break it down. LiPo packs are very light in weight and the power to weight ratio is quite high. What do I mean by that? LiPo batteries can generate an enormous amount of power while being super light. For example, if you have a 1000 mAh battery pack, which is rated at 100C, which is quite a high C rating in my opinion, you will not find quite high C rated batteries that are that small for specifically powering line following robots. You will find those for drones. But nevertheless, the point is if it is a 1000 mAh battery pack with 100C rating, that means that it can deliver one multiplied by 100 that is 100 amps of peak current continuously which is a huge amount of power now if we compare that with a lithium ion battery pack those are generally rated for around 1c to the max that i've seen around 5 to 10c those are molecule lithium ion packs and those are also quite expensive at that price you will simply get a lipo pack so my recommendation is use a lithium polymer pack which is suitable for your bot uh, keeping in mind the voltage rating that you are supplying to your motors if you have a 6 volt motor consider getting a 2s pack if you have a 12 volt motor consider getting a 3s pack and the list goes on and coming to the mh it totally depends upon you but i would say do not keep the battery too heavy do not buy those 2200 mh 4500 mh lipo packs buy something that is light somewhere around i would say 1500 mh or below is the sweet spot is what it is i believe you could also buy super lightweight packs such as 450 mh 350 mh 600 mh it's totally up to you and based on your motor selection so that is something you should keep in mind while powering your bot mistake number six ignoring the chassis design well chassis is like the structure of your bot which holds every component together and just making it in a generic way or do not giving enough time to invest in building one will simply make a robot that is non-reliable and may perform poorly or unexpectedly in the tracks. So make sure you have a chassis which is strong enough to support the weight of your bot, which can take hard impacts because of course your robot might collide with another bot, might collide with the wall while following the line. So you might want to avoid risking damaging your entire bot on the day of the competition and investing the time to build something that is reliable and sturdy at the same time. Well, there are a couple of materials you can utilize to make your robot. Some of them are as follows. Number one, we do have plywood, which in my opinion is the cheapest and best way to build your chassis if you're looking for a cheap option to build your line following robot. And that is exactly what I have done in around four to five of my line following robots I have built in the past. Next, if you're looking for something new, something that you could design in a software and get it manufactured, 
then I would suggest you can go with 3D printing. Now what material should you use for printing your robot's chassis? I recommend using either PLA or use PETG. Well, PETG is a bit more expensive than PLA and it does have the strength to sustain a little bit more impact, but it really doesn't matter because you are not going to a combat robotics competition with a line falling robot. So choose what is available, what is cheap and whatever do you prefer. If you want to escalate things further, you could also go with advanced techniques such as laser cutting acrylic sheets or even CNC milling a carbon fiber sheet, but that is not at all recommended in my opinion if you're getting started. And those cost a lot of money. And honestly, I do not recommend those because you are not getting a lot of return from it uh, considering the cost that we're investing in it. Mistake number seven, incorrect testing environment. Well, once you have built your robot, you need a proper track to test it out. And I see a lot of people using tracks made out of paper made out of sketch pens, black tapes and whatnot and those are a big no because an improperly constructed track gives very less room for the sensors to accurately detect what's underneath it. And if the sensors cannot detect the kind of line or the kind of pattern that's underneath it, then the entire process flow that happens within a line falling robot gets disrupted because the very first step which is sensing the line is not properly done. Hence, it's very important that you get your track printed on a proper flex sheet with proper dimensions and proper measurements in order to test your robot before you can take it to events. Mistake number eight, trying to code up the entire line following program in one go. Well, this is one of the most common mistakes that beginners make, including me, when I thought that I could code up the entire program of the line following robot at once and things would work exactly as expected. Well, in practicality, it's not how things happen and it's way far from theory so you need to make sure that you divide your code into modules which can be tested individually such as getting inputs from the sensors could be one part of code generating the error can be another getting displayed the information which is being received by the robot could be another part of the code tackling special conditions could be another part of it controlling the motors doing special adjustments so that if any part of the code doesn't work you could run that separately and check if it is working the way it's intended to in a separate program and that makes debugging quite easy mistake number nine which is an extension of the discussion we we're having earlier is skipping code debugging which in my opinion is one of the most important but most overlooked points while developing a line following robot especially for beginners now, if you write a code from scratch or you take inspiration from someone else's code or you download someone else's code available on the internet in an open source uh, repository, what happens is you are not aware of the kind of unwanted errors or exceptions that can occur under very special or specific circumstances in an actual competition. That is where exactly debugging begins because you need to make sure that your code generates the least amount of unwanted errors while running on a given track. And the most efficient way in my opinion to do this is by visiting several competitions running your bots understanding what are the limitations of your code coming back home debugging it thoroughly and working on your code to make sure that that specific problem never arises in your bot again well if you do this for a number of competitions eventually you will end up with a completely error-free code and a code in which the bot can smoothly run in most competitions last but not the least lack of patience and iterations while building a hardware project, the most important quality apart from your engineering skills you should have is to be patient because the robot will definitely grow through a number of iterations, through a number of failures, through an uncountable number of sleepless nights that you'll be spending in order to get it to perfection, which will completely demolish the other competitors in a competition. In order to achieve that, you need to make sure that you spend enough time on your robot and be patient even when your robot doesn't perform the way it needs to be having a lot of patience and a lot of confidence in yourself that you can code it up, you can go to different competitions and learn from that instead of getting depressed that your bot is simply not working is what will keep the spirit of building this kind of projects alive. And that is what makes us engineers and separates us from machines. So make sure you have a lot of patience while building any kind of autonomous project, including this particular advanced line falling robot and i wish you the best for your projects so that was it for this video hope you guys liked it if you did make sure you hit the subscribe button like this video share it amongst your friends and stay tuned for more contents like this in the future goodbye